NGOs. I also work, uh, I also worked uh, as a consultant for WHO on uh, the issue of uh, diagnostics, uh, which is another kind of health products. Uh, my background is not uh, economics, it's uh, literature, so it has nothing to do with economics, but I studied also uh, intellectual property law uh, for uh, short um, trainings uh, in, uh, conducted by, by various uh, organizations. So um, this is to introduce myself. I will go uh, fast in the subjects in the reports that I will uh, pre present to you today. So um, in 2019, sorry, in 2019, um, I was uh, based in Geneva at that time, and I um, I was working um, as part of various organizations on ac access to medicines, and I heard about a resolution um called improving the transparency of markets for medicines vaccines and other health products i heard that this uh, project of resolution was uh, being discussed uh, between member states of the world uh, world health organizations in geneva and i was very surprised to learn that uh, most uh, european countries mm, let's say northern european countries such as france were uh, against the resolutions and were trying to block the text. So um, as I was uh, working at uh, in that moment on issues such as uh, tuberculosis, uh, uh, vi uh, viral hepatitis, and I was seeing the consequences of the lack of transparency in uh, health products, I, I was very um, bothered by the fact uh, that some countries were opposing themselves to, um, to transparency of markets in for medicines. So um, I advocated strongly with uh, other colleagues, including Jérôme Martin, and we decided uh, to push for this resolution because we thought that uh, improving transparency in the health sectors could help, uh, could help in the um, uh, in um, on the various issues that this sector is facing. And we decided to launch uh, OTMEDS, which is uh, the Observatory of uh, Drug Transparency, just after, uh, so in uh, in June 2019. So I, I wanted to present you this now because it's also to, uh, to explain, uh, to tell you uh, um, with uh, which um, angle we decided to, um, we decided to, to produce this report that I will now present you. So this report was, um, was a demand from a group at the European Parliament, um, a group of uh, members of the Parliament asked us to try to uh, evaluate how the relocation of uh, pharmaceutical industry in Europe and in its member states could be possible. Um, the request by this group was made uh, in uh, June 2020, so it was in the context of the beginning of the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic with um, many issues around health products, as, as you of course know, uh, such as, for example, the vaccines, but also uh, diagnostics and other health products that were um, with a demand that, was a st uh, that could not uh, stop increasing at that moment. So uh, this, uh, mem this group at the European Parliament asked us, asked us to work on this report. We work on this report for almost one year, and we were completely independent in the, in the way we uh, de decided to, uh, to construct, to build the report, and in the people that we interviewed for the report. So, um, so the methodology, I will not go into details, but uh, because it's in the report itself, but um, we conducted interviews, we, uh, and also in parallel, we conducted a review of the literature on the topic. And after this phase, we, uh, we started the analysis and, and the writing of the conclusion. Um, so maybe as an introduction, I would like to, uh, to really start um, by stressing the fact that uh, the right to health is a human right, because in, um, in the field of access to medicines and probably also for you in the economical field, um, it's true that sometimes we, um, we forget, uh, we can forget that it's not only about uh, markets, 
but it's also about people accessing uh, accessing the the products they need to live and to survive. So I think it's important to uh, to remind that the right to health is a human right, and that's something that uh, we as uh, activists or, or as a researcher doing activism wants to really protect. And also, it's also something that many governments want to protect. And the idea of this report was also to see how we can. Uh, we can, which kind of solutions we can be here uh, to protect, to ensure the right to health. So the context, uh, I think you know uh, most of it, but um, there is a, there's, a, there's been a dynamic of increasing of the price of medicines in France, uh, in uh, in Italy, in other in other places in Europe. Uh, there has been a huge increase of, uh, of of prices of medicines in 2013, 2014. New medicines developed again hepatitis C um, was marketed for about 40,000 euros uh, for the duration of the treatment, which was uh, which is three months. And at that time, uh, we calculated that we if uh, we uh, I was working at that time for Médecins du Monde and we produced a report on this and we calculated that if we wanted uh, in France to put everybody who needed it at that time uh, on this treatment. So everybody with, uh, with uh, uh, hepatitis C um, in a fibrose uh, stage advanced that really requires a treatment as soon as possible, it would take up the entire budget of Paris hospitals. So uh, we made these calculations to highlight the fact that a price like this, 40,000 euros, um, is not sustainable if you look at how much it would cost to um, to the French uh, uh, Security Social, the French uh, public uh, social insurance to cover it for all those who need it. So our fear at that time, uh, when when this price uh, came up and was agreed uh, between the uh, the originator company Gilead and the French government, our fear was to to see um, this dynamic of increase two years after, because there was no uh, rational criteria uh, be behind these 40,000 euros. And that was our fear. And unfortunately, after in the following years, there were uh, various uh, cancer treatments that were marketed for more than 100,000 euros per, per cure. And more recently, in 2019, a treatment for rare uh, disease that was, uh, that was uh, marketed for 2 million euros per treatment, just for one shot of one treatment. So uh, there's been this increase of the price of medicines, and that's one of the reasons we think that there is uh, something that's not going uh, properly in the sector of uh, pharmaceuticals. And we have to put that in perspective with the other um, issues that's fa facing the sector, for example, in France and Yes, let's say in France, let's focus on France on this. There has been lots of austerity measures on the public health system, on public hospitals, a lot of cuts. Um, but actually, actually, it's something that we have been seeing also in other, in other European countries. We think, I think, of course, of, about Greece, for example, or, or Spain. Um, so there has been a decrease of, uh, of the funding allocated to uh, public hospitals, public health systems. And so on one hand, we, um, the states put more money uh, to, um, to cover the increase of the price of the new medicines. And on the other hand, uh, there are these austerity measures where you see uh, prevention, uh, um, activities of prevention or of, and various other cares that are being stopped uh, because there is not enough, uh, enough funding. So um, that's the that's the context. There is another uh, key question here, and that's really in the um, in the news these days. Unfortunately, it's the issue of the shortages of uh, of medicines, the stockouts and the shortages. So um, stockouts and shortages of medicines. It's when the states um, can't uh, purchase or have enough of the. Um, of the products that it needs to cover the market, and it leads to um, to the lack, to the impossibility for uh, health health workers, health practitioners, or pharmacists to provide the the medicines to uh, the people who need it. 
So um, it's something structural. Uh, it means that we have been seeing that uh, that increase already for the past 10 years of the number of shortages reported to the, um, to the medicines agencies. I put here INSM, which is the French medicine agency, but it's also the case in other European countries. So there has been an increase of these uh, shortages. It shortages, um, there are shortages of all kinds of medicines, um, essential medicines. I would say probably uh, all medicines, but not the blockbusters, not those who are, that the companies can, uh, can charge the more for, but for all the others, all the others, uh, from the insulin to uh, antiretroviral used against HIV, and so on, and essential medicines, there has been uh, shortages and stock outs uh, in, many, in many places. So that's one thing I really want to insist on today. And maybe, um, so I would like to also add here that in the past 10 years, that there has also been an, um, more requests, more as to the company made to the companies to report the uh, the st stocks and, and also uh, shortages. So if we have this inc this increase of the figures, it's also because there is more uh, because the companies are reporting more um, in more proper way uh, the, the the shortages and the stock. Out. So I also want to add this to be uh, uh, to be fair here. So there, there are these structural shortages, but there is another uh, kind of shortages. It's the conjunctural shortages. It's those who are linked to the current situation. So of course, there is the, the current context. There is the COVID uh, first wave. Uh, there was the COVID first wave where some emergency room um, treatments were lacking in uh, French uh, hospitals. Um, so, um, Unfortunately, it uh, conducted to the incapacity for health authorities in France to be reactive and to uh, and to produce the uh, the missing medicines. So, um, there, I, I think here it's important to understand that there is the COVID situation, but there is an increase of the global population, as you know. So there will be more. Uh, there will be constantly more uh, an increasing um, need of medicines. So um, there, there is a need to increase the production in total, let's say. Um, so that, that's also this that at stake. And on top of all of this, there are the risks of other new pandemics uh, linked to, um, it's, links, it's linked to the fact that we are, of course, the, the link between environmental issues and health issues, the fact that the harm that we are doing to the, to the environment is leading to the emergence of new pandemics. So this factor was, will also lead to an increase, uh, to, to incre uh, increasing an incre increasing need of uh, for our health products. And uh, finally, I would say there is the ge geopolitical situation. Um, so this report was written, was launched in March 2022. So it was just at the moment the the start of the of the war. Uh, in Ukraine, and here we can really say that this parameter, this factor, is very important to take in consideration, um, which is that um, there is an increase of uh, of the raw material worldwide, uh, and it leads to uh, other an increase of the price, inc uh, to the incapacity for for producers of the raw material to provide uh, and to produce what they what they need to eat. It, uh, it has a lot of, um, uh, of impact on the production uh, chain for, for, for medicines. And for now, it has been, uh, we, have been, we have been seeing the, the increase of the price uh, of energy, which had consequences on the uh, producers of active pharmaceutical ingredients, which is a, a very critical step of um, the, the making of medicines. And it's concentrated in China and also in India. Um, so there is this, uh, this issue that's very important to have in mind when we talk about, uh, I would say, maybe any market, but at least, let's say, the pharmaceutical markets. Um, we also say, see that if there is, for example, an increasing of the tensions, uh, diplomatical issues between uh, the United States and Taiwan uh, and, and China around Taiwan, 
it can also lead to uh, it can also have consequences on Chinese production and we we in the access to medicine sector we are worried uh, on the fact that maybe one day we hope not uh, but uh, that uh, the export of uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients um, from China could uh, could be uh, an argument in uh, in, in geo geopolitical geostrategical uh, conflict situations. So it's another uh, issue that I wanted to bring today because I we I think it's important to also uh, to also see that there is this issue that can an impact on the global uh, production. So um, maybe to start the typology of the pharmaceutical markets, I will not go into details because it's detailed uh, uh, in the report and uh, I invite you to, uh, to read if you have not done it yet, the, the book of Nathalie Coutinet uh, describing the sector of the pharmaceutical markets because it describes very well the, the, the merging and acquisitions of between, uh, between companies. And the fact that this sector is more and more um, concentrated um, with uh, less and less actors who have, uh, who have in their hands the, the global markets. Uh, I would just want to take two examples here, uh, maybe to make it more concrete on, uh, on, yes, on two, with two examples. Um, we know that by 2045, there will be 500, 500 uh, millions people in the world who would um, be living with diab diabetes. And in the fight against diabetes, there is uh, one, one medicine that's critical, it's insulin. Insulin is critical to, uh, to survive when you, have, uh, when you have type 1 diabetes. You need it every day. And if you miss uh, one day, you can die. So that's a really, uh, that's an essential medicine, it's very important. And today, so the, the, the insulin was discovered at the University of Toronto in, uh, in 1921 by two researchers who wanted to make it a, a common, common goods. They wanted uh, nobody to, to be able to make money out of it. They thought that insulin should uh, belong to the world. Unfortunately, one century later, um, there are three companies in the world that concentrate than have uh, the, the that have uh, about 80% uh, of the global market of insulin. And it has a lot of consequences on the access to insulin. For example, in the United States, um, there, be, there are many stories of, uh, of uh, people who are dying because they can't afford um, several sometimes up to $2,000 per month for insulin. Um, so we see many, we have many examples of, uh, of um, uh, young adults who uh, share their, um, their insulin with their parents. Um, and uh, of course it has uh, very bad consequences for the health and there are many stories, unfortunately, of people in the United States who die because of this. So that's an example of the market concentration with three producers. There are issues of patents still around insulin, but uh, the issue of the concentration is very key to understand uh, this uh, market. And then there is another example that I know pretty well because I worked uh, for different organizations on this. It's the uh, in vitro diagnostic markets. For example, the PC, uh, PCR tests uh, that, um, that are used Every day now to make uh, to make uh, to conduct COVID nineteen tests. Um, so these kind of uh, of diagnostics are, are critical. They are critical, for example, to diagnose uh, HIV AIDS, uh, viral hepatitis, uh, other infectious diseases, COVID, and they work with um, platforms that are locked to the regions of uh, of a few producers. And so, for example, if you go to Paris hospitals, uh, for example, if you go to uh, La Pitié Salpêtrière, where there is, there is a huge um, there is a huge room with many uh, platforms that conduct uh, most of the tests for Paris hospitals, public hospitals, you see that these platforms um, they are blocked to uh, to the regions of uh, of one or two producers who are often Roche or Abbott. 
And once you have bought the, the machine, the platform, you can't use the region from another brand. So you have to buy uh, forever from the, from the same uh, uh, company. And sometimes we have seen that, for example, in Brazil, um, sometimes the company decides to uh, unilaterally to increase the price of the regions. So that's another example of the concentration of the market. There is a few producers, uh, Roche, Abbott, uh, Biomérieux, and a few others um, who, are, who have uh, won these global markets. And here, for example, during the COVID uh, first waves, um, many diagnostics for other um, diseases were, were, were lacking because the producers had decided to uh, uh, to dedicate the, the factory that were before producing other regions to the regions used against COVID-19. So it had an impact on the, and, of, and there, there were shortages, for example, of regions for uh, um, uh, HPV virus uh, and, uh, and other, and other uh, infectious diseases. So that's also another consequence, consequence of the of the concentration of the markets. Um, now on the financialization of the markets, um, once again, it's something that uh, Nathalie Coutinet had wor worked a lot on, but I would like to give two, two examples. Uh, one is Sophos Bivir, the medicines that I mentioned that uh, is used against hepatitis C uh, and that were marketed for about 40,000, 50,000 euros per three months. We can think, and it's most of the time, what we what we hear that uh, uh, this price is uh, set in order to uh, uh, for the originator company to recover from its investments in research and development. But when we look at the details, um, often we see that the company um, that's marketing the the product is not the one that had been developing or that developed the, the, the product. So for example, for Sophos Buvir, uh, the company uh, Gilead decided in 2011 to buy Pharmaset, which was uh, another company, and to buy it for several, uh, several billion US dollars. And uh, Gilead um, had such an increase of its bonds that he didn't need uh, to, uh, to sell one single uh, tablet of Sophos Bevir to recover from its investment on buying pharmacists. So here we see that it's an example for uh, really that illustrates very well the, the research and development with uh, pharmaceutical companies. Most of the times, the main multi, uh, multinational companies are not the one who have been conducting or conducted the funda fundamental research or the clinic or the, the first phases of the clinical trials. Another example is Zoglensma, so the two million uh, US dollars or euros uh, treatments. Um, the re fundamental research was, um, was made by INSERM mostly, so the French uh, National uh, Institute uh, for Research. And then it was conducted by Teleton, which is um, caritative uh, funding with uh, tax, uh, uh, tax cuts, um, some, of, uh, some of, the, of the funding that are not, uh, that have a tax ex exemption. So um, there has been also public money for this, but what happened is that the, the multinational company Novartis decided to buy the, the company that had developed through the Teleton the, the, this technology and to sell it for two millions uh, per, per treatment per person. So these two examples are, I think, important for, for you to understand that um, there is a finance, financialization. It's not, the risks are not made by uh, in necessarily by invest investing on researchers who are conducting uh, the fundamental research and um, it's also some bets uh, some that are that the multinationals are making uh, to try to uh, to invest on some products that maybe will uh, give them uh, a return on investments in the short term 
And so, unfortunately, unfortunately, what we have seen as a consequence, direct consequence of this uh, financialization of the markets is that it conducted uh, the multinational companies to, uh, to give up on the research and development for some on some, di uh, some diseases that are not, according to them, uh, profitable enough. So, of course, all these diseases that are only affecting the, the global south, such as uh, tropical neg neglected diseases, or also uh, other, other, uh, other diseases, unfortunately. Um, so one thing maybe that I would like to add on the research and development part is that there is a lot of uh, public money, public funding that are being uh, invested um, and we, um, the observatory Otemet, we have been asking for more transparency on this to see how much uh, for each um, medicine the public sector had also contributed to. Because sometimes there is, uh, we can see that the states are um, are paying for the for the same health products at different steps. First, by investing in the research and development. Uh, then in the clinical trials, we threw some ads, specific ads to the companies. And then by buying the medicines once they are marketed. And finally, we see that there is also um, ma massive tax evasion, evasion from, this, uh, from these companies. So that this um, um, table that you can see here is from the American organization, Americans for uh, uh, Tax Fairness. It's from 2018, and it shows that there that the main pharmaceutical companies here, that's the, the US-based multinational uh, companies, are um, have each at least between between uh, 1 billion and 25 billion uh, tax tax uh, avoidance on offshore profits so uh, it's uh, it's also another um, other money uh, other parts of uh, what the what the companies do not contribute to the back to the to the states so um, in our report, so there is all the context that I presented you. The, there is the topolo typology of the of the sector and uh, how how it is uh, fi financialized and concentrated. Uh, I would like to now to to switch to to move to another part, which is on the relocation, uh, because it was the object of the report. Uh, once we we have seen all this, um, how. How what what is the relocation uh, of uh, of the production of health products that we would like that we would like to see? So here um, I think it's critical to to understand uh, because sometimes it's something that uh, uh, that everybody don't know specifically, but there are different phases in the production of medicines. And it's important to distinguish them uh, from one another. First, um, so there are different, different first stage. Uh, there is the synthetic uh, chemistry, uh, the production of uh, pharmaceutical products resulting from uh, chemical synthesis. There is the fermentation, the products of uh, production of separation of pharmaceutical chemicals, such as antibiotics and vitamins uh, from microorganisms. There is the extraction, the production of biological or bot uh, botanical products, dairy from uh, organic products from animals or plants. And there is the biological production, the use of microorganisms and genetic engineering tools to produce vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. Um, then there is a formula step, the transfer transformation of the raw material or the bulk there is different way to uh, to call it uh, bulk raw materials or active pharmaceutical ingredients, and then the the formula steps is the moment where you change this raw material to different formulations, different dosages, different forms, such as tablets, capsules, in injectable solutions, creams, and so on. So. Um, 
So um, I think it's it's critical uh, to understand that without the first stage, which is the production of the raw material, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the API, um, it's impossible to, to do anything. And this API production is concentrated in, uh, in China and in India mostly. Um, I think maybe before moving to this specifically, I would like to, uh, uh, to detail a little bit more what, uh, if we want to, uh, to relocate the production, we have to think about which, which medicines we want to relocate. We have heard a lot in France uh, through the program uh, France Relance, the government uh, saying that she had decided to, uh, to relocate the production of API of paracetamol. But paracetamol is only one medicine among many others. Uh, of course, it's important, but there is more than, there are several, several hundreds of medicines of uh, major therapy, therapeutic benefits or essential medicines according to, uh, from the WHO, the World Health Organization list. So um, we have to think if we want to relocate the production, we have to think to choose which medicines we want to produce. And that's where I think, um, and we really saw it through this report, that it's critical that a country such as France work jointly with other countries in Europe and other, other countries to, uh, to, to see which country can produce uh, which medicines because clearly France or another country in Europe will not uh, alone be able to produce the API uh, for um, any single uh, of these hundreds of medicines. So I think it's important to, uh, to clarify this or to have this uh, in the, discussions to, the discussion today. Here I want, uh, before talking about the, the example of midazolam, I, I would like to, uh, to talk about the critical work that has been uh, doing a pharmacologist uh, called uh, Andrew Hill from the University of Liverpool. And since 2010, he has uh, decided to try to uh, calculate the real production costs for medicines, which is uh, to base um, is calculation not on hypothetic, uh, hypothet hypothetical uh, elements, but on, on real uh, elements. So his idea was to try to see, to compare uh, the cost of production to the final uh, price negotiated between, by, between the pharmaceutical companies and the states. Um, maybe I would like to add one thing here. Uh, when we talked, um, when we talk to the to the people in Brazil within, within the Brazilian government who um, who designed the uh, the industrial strategy for Brazil of the production of uh, of the public production of health products, they told us that knowing the real cost of production was something that had been critical uh, to them in their strategy. Because we I will develop that a little bit later in the presentation. But Brazil is one country that has uh, developed um, its uh, public uh, production for medicines. So uh, the studies, all this to say that the studies made by Andrew, uh, Andrew Hill are critical and very important. And he had done it first on HIV medicines, but then he, he did it for hepatitis C medicines. So again, to take the example of the Sophos uh, where while it was marketed in France, the first first price was 56,000 uh, euros. Um, at, this, at the same moment, the estimated uh, co production cost was around, uh, was about 120 euros. So we can see a huge um, differential between the, the cost of production and the final price. And usually uh, what uh, Andrew Hill says is that there is no correlation between the capacity of paying of a country, uh, no, let's say the social economic goal status of a country and the prices uh, proposed. For example, in, the, in North Africa, if we compare, because I worked a lot uh, in, in, North, in North Africa, I remember some studies that were conducted, uh, including by WHO, uh, the office uh, in, uh, for the Mediterranean region, um, when we compare the prices in Egypt and in Morocco that had exactly the same, um, the same so, uh, 
socio-economical status uh, at the World Bank, and um, we could see that Egypt was always uh, always negotiating the prices of medicines much lower than Morocco. So, um, so for Andrew, it's very what Andrew Hill says often is that there is no correlation between uh, the um, between uh, the, the the economical status of a country and the final price. So um, the real production cost is a tool to try to understand, and it can uh, it help us also, I think, to understand that prices of medicines are really constructed. Um, and that's what we try to do uh, with our work is try to deconstruct this to see uh, to see if, if these prices are fair, if they are sustainable for the states, and how they could be more um, rational rationally how they could be more rationally uh, set so this is the price versus cost so here you have the the, the model that andrew hill used uh, to uh, calculate the cost of production so basically what he does is that he, he uses the cost of, of the api but it's not a, a an hypothetical uh, uh, price of the api that he gets it's he has uh, access to uh, to a software that allows him to uh, to see the transactions of and the shipments in the world of um, the API of one drug to um, another place. So he can see that uh, today uh, or this month or last month, a company in Western Europe bought uh, a kilo of API of Sophos Buvir uh, for um, for x, x amount in China, for example. And then from, uh, from this cost of the API, uh, he calculates uh, how much API you need per tablet. He had some excipients and uh, he had the cost linked to the excipients, the cost of the materials per tablet. Then uh, he had the cost of production per tablet and uh, he had uh, different uh, uh, factors such as a profit margin of 10% and tax on profits. And um, and then it, uh, at the end of this, he has uh, an estimation of uh, the price of generic uh, minimum price per tablet. So what we what we try to to study uh, to look at in the report uh, was to see if there were there were alternative models of um, of production of medicines in the world. Uh, because most of uh, the models that we that we see are like the ones in the U.S. or in France, they are based on the on the demands. So uh, uh, every time there is an increase of the demands, there are shortages. Or this is the country that can pay the more uh, that uh, that will receive the medicines. So we try to see if there were alternative uh, production models in the world. So. The one that uh, seems very interesting to look at is the Brazilian model. Um, I will detail a little bit here the Brazilian model. In the at the end of the of the eighties, um, the the Brazilian government decided to develop uh, to have a strategy for to, uh, to produce uh, publicly, uh, locally uh, medicines in uh, in Brazil. And then from that moment uh, to uh, to now, there has been a lot of uh, of production of essential medicines in Brazil. In 1996, in Brazil, uh, the right to health was uh, was in, in, uh, included in the Brazilian constitution. And then um, the government uh, of Brazil decided to try to articulate the public production uh, to um, to fulfilling the needs of the population. Uh, in 1996, there were also the, um, the arrival in markets in France, in, uh, in European countries, in the, in the US, of uh, the antiretrovirals uh, used against HIV. And the Brazilian population was, uh, al was also hit uh, very strongly by HIV. So there was a challenge at that moment for the Brazilian government to provide medicines to uh, the people who needed it. So um, that's maybe... It was probably one step very important in Brazil, uh, where uh, people there tried to accelerate also the uh, the production of uh, of the public production of uh, of critical essential medicines. So um, 
Brazil uh, has been uh, has been producing very important medicines. The medicines that I mentioned against hepatitis C, they are produced uh, partly publicly in Brazil. Um, they are, of course, the prices paid are um, the price um, the prices paid for some other medicines are also. Um, taking advantage of the capacity of Brazil to produce its medicines, which means that in the negotiations between the Brazilian state and pharmaceutical companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies know that if they ask for a price that's very, very, uh, very high, the Brazilian um, authorities can say, we this, then we produce it publicly. And then um, we, we think that this uh, local production, public local production has also a good, um, a good impact is a good um, is good in order to uh, to uh, to make the negotiation uh, pro uh, process of the prices more a little bit more balanced. So um, the Brazilian model is very interesting, and really, I invite you if you are, if you are interested in that to look at um, at the different uh, articles that were that that were published on this subject because there have been many many of them. And um, they explain very well how uh, the Brazilian states has managed something that uh, that's very impressive because they they really managed to have uh, many people accessing uh, accessing medicines thanks to that. Then we looked at other um, alternative uh, models of production um, during the first wave of uh, of the COVID nineteen. Uh, we we. And even before, no, even even before uh, in the in the Netherlands, I think this example is very interesting because uh, I think this example is interesting. In the Netherlands, in two thousand eighteen, um, the government of the Netherlands was negotiating the price of a pediatric cancer treatment with the company uh, Novartis, and the price was uh, considered by the government too high. So what they decided to do was to produce, uh, because it was a very small number of people who needed this treatment, uh, the government decided to produce it through the hospitals publicly. So uh, up to now, there has been production of this medicine in the Netherlands in uh, public uh, hospitals and clinics. Uh, so here again, uh, we can say that the public production can, um, can be a good answer uh, when the prices asked by uh, by a company are too high. Uh, here it's another example that I will not uh, detail too much, but that's in the report. It's open insulin. It's some um, researchers who are uh, activists. They define themselves activists, and they want to address the problem of the price of meat, uh, of insulin in the U.S. that I mentioned. Um, they want to address it, and then they are they are looking at some uh, small scale production of insulin uh, in the U.S. And they are trying to uh, to make it uh, to make it possible. The, the the only problem that I see with this model is that insulin to be to reach um, is insulin is very is is quite difficult to produce and to produce a little little amount of it you need a lot uh, you you need a big capacity. So it's um, maybe a little challenging to address. Uh, to 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 make it work in a smaller sc uh, smaller scales, but it seems interesting and also the 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 products uh, the final products that they have they can um, they can really have it for for prices very very low. So it's interesting to have this uh, to have in mind this alternative model. Then of course um, in many countries there is a military production. Uh, so it's um, also something that we try to investigate, but as you can imagine, there is a, there is a lot of, uh, of secrets and opacity behind, which is actually produced by the militaries, but there is this kind of fac facilities in, in many countries. Um, and also maybe to, to conclude here, I, I know that there are some discussions in uh, public hospitals in France. Uh, on this, uh, whether or not uh, French public hospitals should uh, uh, work on on the production of some medicines, I will not uh, go too much too much on the details on this because 
I, I preferred uh, focusing on the production part, but I would like to um, to really say that one of the thing that Brazil has done very well was to articulate all the production issues uh, that I mentioned with uh, the issue of uh, intellectual property rights, which means that um, their patent office, um, their patent office um, and the government decided to waive, uh, to waive intellectual property rights or to or to buy, or to bypass them uh, when they decided that they wanted to produce uh, generically uh, medicines that were uh, still covered by a patent. Uh, maybe I realized here that maybe I should uh, tell a little bit more about uh, our, the patent system. So the patent um, the patent system worldwide. So it's uh, the patent rights in general. They are the, those are territory, territorial uh, rights, so country by country of, or groups of country uh, uh, and countries. But since uh, 1994, there is uh, an international um, agreement called TRIPS um, that, um, uh, that were signed within the WTO, the World Trade Organizations, and that harmonize or wants to harmonize intellectual property standards uh, within the WTO member states. So uh, within this agreement, um, there are some standards that the countries are, have all to implement. For example, at least, for example, to grant at least a monopoly of 20 years on a product um, to, the, to the patent holder in and uh, so that's one of the obligations, but there are also what we call some um, flexibilities, which is um, the possibility for countries um, to, um, to, for example, um, uh, waive intellectual property rights when they think that the right to health is more important. Or for example, in case of uh, a global pandemic or uh, uh, in a pandemic in the country or national uh, emergency, national health emergency. So, um, for example, to make uh, the production of uh, antiretrovirals against HIV happen, what the Brazilian state did uh, starting from uh, 1996, they issued what we call a compulsory license, which is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a text which is of, often very short, one page, where the state uh, declared that. Uh, uh, for uh, for determined time or for or undefined time, um, they will uh, allow um, a producer or different producers to produce the protected um, health products to pro to uh, to um, to produce it despite the the patents. So that's one possibility that the countries have. They can use this compulsory license. Or they can, and I think um, if maybe if you have one thing to remember on in intellectual property and patents, it would be that sometimes we think that patents can be uh, granted, uh, that they are granted for, for innovations, only for innovations. But usually, usually when we look in details, we see that many patent offices grant patents for uh, almost um, auto automatically, uh, even without really looking if uh, the inventions is uh, really uh, fulfilling the inventive step and it's really uh, bringing something important compared to uh, what, uh, what we already know in the field. Um, that for, I think it's very important for some, for some medicines, for example, Sophos Buvir, the, the Gilead, the medicines uh, uh, patented by Gilead that we talked about. Um, this medicine, if we look at, if, when pharmacologists look at it, and when they compare it to the patent law of uh, different countries, they actually see that even if the medicine is uh, critical to uh, to save the life of many people, um, it doesn't fulfill really the inventive steps and the step of novelty uh, if we look at strictly at the at the law. Uh, so that's why in Egypt, for example, um, because in Egypt, hepatitis ITC was uh, a major public health concern. 10 million people, 10 millions, 10 millions were affected by hepatitis C. 
Um, so the governments had to find solutions to provide uh, this very expensive treatment to the population. So in 2013, early 2014, the Patent Office of Egypt decided to reject the demand of uh, Patent of Gilead. And they based it on this lack of uh, novelty. And what uh, they managed to do thanks to that was to have uh, um, Egyptian generic producers to be able to produce immediately this treatment and to have it available for this population almost immediately. So um, that's also one thing that we developed a bit in the report. It was the importance when uh, we talk about the production, uh, in, yes, including the, the public production, to, uh, to coordinate it for countries to coordinate it with uh, intellectual property issues. So here, uh, maybe the main conclusions. Uh, um, so that's, of course, that's, uh, that's what we believe in uh, within our organization. We fight uh, for the right to health. So we think that the health, uh, the right to health should, uh, should come before the right to property and that public health, um, that public, pro uh, that health products are, are not uh, good, like um, other uh, uh, consumption goods. Um, that we also saw in our research that there was a complete opacity uh, on who is producing what and where. So every time we have information on the API producers, on, uh, on the patent holders, on all this is after conducting a lot of research, a lot of investigation that usually the health authorities don't do or don't have the time to do when they negotiate the price of medicines. So they negotiate the price of medicines with many elements that are missing to them, that they don't have. Um, we think that a production strategy should be articulated with a sanitary needs strategy uh, for, and it would be a way to have more, uh, to more anticipation. We think that there should be at least three facilities of, uh, for, each, uh, for the production of each medicine. Here, I think it's important because it's not only about uh, it's it's about uh, the right to health. It's about uh, se uh, 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 security as well because we have we had the example of rifapentin, which is a treatment used against tuberculosis that was only produced that is only produced uh, close to Rome in a factory in Italy by Sanofi. And there was in 2018, 2019, there was an impurity, there was a problem in the in the in the plant, and it had it had a consequence to interrupt uh, the production of uh, rifapentin for the for the whole world, and it conducted to uh, short, to some uh, shortages. So it's not safe to have uh, the concentration of the production of one medicine or one or the API of one medicine only in one country because they can be a war, they can be uh, impurity, they can be various problems. So there should be at least three facilities uh, in three different countries. And this is also, this is something that uh, the pharmacologist Andrew Hill told us during the hearing that we made with him uh, during the, the interview for this report. Um, another researcher who worked for the Gradet Institute uh, in Geneva, uh, Surimun, um, told us that she thinks that there should not be um, that is not a problem to have sometimes some overlapping of the production of key essential medicines um, because maybe there will be overlapping and maybe there will be more medicines that, that we will need, but we can't uh, afford the fact that for one reason, uh, during one month, there will not be at all uh, some essential medicines and that it would lead to the death uh, of people. Um, so one thing that we, we also saw clearly and that we see even more clearly now is the, that public production should be put in place for the essential medicines that are facing regularly shortages um, and that it should be used, this public production, also to enable a little bit uh, to have for, for, for states to have more leverage in the price negotiation uh, with, uh, with originator companies. And 
mostly I would, I would say this. Also, we have seen something a little bit shocking. We have realized that uh, there were, it was reported by several uh, medias in France, such as Le Monde, there were many problems linked to the management of stocks in countries. So basically the main, uh, um, the basic things to, um, to manage the logistic, to manage the stock for, for medicines were, um, were completely, uh, uh, completely missing in France. And there were many medicines in the strategical uh, uh, stock of France that uh, that had expired, that they could not be used. So it's a problem and it's a serious problem. So in the stock management, there should be something also to be done. And clearly, um, something that I've not talked about, but I think it's critical, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, it's in industry, uh, very polluting, this production. So we think that uh, there is really an opportunity when we think about the relocation of the production uh, in Europe, in France, in Italy, in other countries, to have to think about more uh, envir environmental friendly uh, norms to, uh, to produce this API. Because we can also wonder uh, if it's fair that the production of our medicines and the, the pollution linked to this production is, concentr is concentrated only in one, two, three countries uh, in uh, South Asia and Eastern Asia, Asia. So maybe that's another element for the for the discussion. And maybe uh, um, so yes. So the the ten measures. So after doing this report, we decided to have uh, as a conclusion to have ten emergency measures to be to be put in place. So I will go quickly because you have the report, so you can uh, go back to it, but. We think that to establish transparency uh, is is, uh, is critical because we we have seen that there is a lot of public investment uh, in the in research and development uh, by the states. So there is a lot of money uh, that is invested by the states, and we we see that countries have to uh, uh, negotiate the price of medicines without these elements without knowing who has contributed to what uh, to negotiate uh, this. Because the price negotiation uh, for medicines, it's not the same as negotiating the price uh, for a car. For instance, if you need to buy a car or a computer, if the price is too high, you can decide either to buy to buy it later or to go to another seller with, uh, that will propose another price. For medicines, when there is a monopoly, uh, you can't do that. You have no choice. So you have, uh, you can either have, uh, you can you pay or you don't have the access to the products. And it also puts the states in a very difficult situation when they negotiate the price of medicines because they, um, while they want to negotiate a better price, they also they also have uh, their population waiting for the medicines, and sometimes they know that some people in the waiting process will die. Will die. So um, it increases the pressure on them and it, be, it, it makes the negotiations uh, very difficult. So we think that transparency is absolutely critical to, uh, to negotiate, uh, to negotiate uh, the, uh, the price of medicines. Excuse me. So we think that another uh, important thing is mapping the national and the European production of pharmaceutical products. We were uh, very surprised to see that many critical actors in the sector of, uh, of health in Europe don't have this Pauline, information. Pauline, if, if, if I may, if you could, in not more than five minutes, we are already one hour, so. Sure, sure, no sure. Problem. Thank you. Sure, I, I conclude, sorry. Um, so I will go very, very quickly, but these elements are missing, the production, uh, national production of pharmaceutical products. We, we even people is very important in the sectors don't have access to these informations. So here it's, uh, it's things that I developed already. So now I will not uh, go back on that. Um,
We think also that uh, the role of uh, the World Health Organization should be uh, strengthened uh, because we have seen in the COVID-19 uh, crisis that W the World Trade Organizations were uh, were the one where uh, where the discussions were taking place. So we think that the these debates on the production of pharmaceuticals should uh, uh, go back to uh, to the place where it should be, which is the World Health Organization as well. So we think that there is, a, there is also a lack, a huge lack of uh, of understanding of these topics by administrative leaders, uh, health, um, yes, uh, uh, politicals, um, people elected, and there is a lot of fight against conflict of interest to be made. And I will uh, I will stop here, and I hope I was not too long, and I'm I'm very happy to uh, to hear your questions now. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I will call the, um, I hope you hear us. Yes, uh, maybe uh, Nada and Selma, you can come that way. Do you hear us? Do you hear us? I can, hear. I can hear you, yes. Yes, okay. So Selma and uh, Nada will, I think you shall be here so the camera can, so you can, you can use this computer, right, or no? Ah, uh, okay. okay uh, try to get it from. I mean, he changed the computer. It's not his computer. It's uh, Elvira's computer. So. Or, or the other thing is that you can you can you can you connect to Zoom here? Do you have a con? Okay, so one second, Pauline. We just. We are about to to start. We are translating Cyrillic into other type of. <laughs> Okay, the mic is here. So, Pauline, can you just uh, with your head, you you hear us? Yes. Yes, fine. Okay, so I give the floor. Uh, uh, you, you shall come here. Okay. Then you, you shall, it, it will change. Or, okay. Uh, that, uh, um, okay, hello everyone. How are you? Um, thanks you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Londes. 
uh, for being with us. Um, we hope it was uh, in person, but maybe uh, next time. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, the report was very inclusive. We read it, uh, me and Salma, and we would like to ask you, uh, like after COVID, which company you think had achieved higher profits from COVID? Which pharmaceutical company? Any guesses? Yeah, let's move. Next slide. Um, again. Slide. Yeah, it's actually true. Um, Pfizer achieved more than 100, over 100% 100 of uh, the profits. And um, maybe to go back, we will summarize the report quickly and add more analysis whenever we can. Um, I'm going to go through the typology um, Mrs. Londex mentioned, the concentration and fi financialization of pharmaceutical industry, the big pharma model, um, small number of multinational dominating the global market and achieving over profits, <clears throat> um, as we can see in the case of COVID. And um, profits are led less by investment and more by assets and speculation. Um, as you mentioned, the example of um, Gilead uh, buyout of Pharma Asset, the company that developed originally hepatitis C medicine. Um, and Gilead made a buyout uh, to Pharma Asset and then its stock went, went high that it was able to amortize um, its, uh, this buyout without selling a single medicine. So yeah, we found this code by Roby Silverman, uh, Oxfam, America's Director, Private Sector Engagement. He says, like Big Pharma's business model, receive billions in public investment, charge uh, exorbitant prices for life-saving medicine, pay less taxes, little tax. Um, this is gold dust for wealthy investors and corporate executive, but devastating for global uh, public health. Would like to speak more about APIs. So APIs or active pharmaceutical ingredients are considered to be any substance or a mix of substances uh, that will uh, later be used to produce uh, finished medications. So I'm sick right now, unfortunately, and now I'm taking Fervex. Fervex is a uh, produced by UPSA, which is a pharm French pharmaceutical company. On my box, it says that it's produced in France. Uh, the active ingredient here is paracetamol, but what you need to know is that uh, the EU uh, imports 800 tons of paracetamol from India every month. So who knows where my paracetamol comes from? I don't know. So India contributes the most to so 62% in um, filling in, uh, um, in uh, API drug master files. Uh, it's been a sharp increase from 2000s when it uh, contributed with 20% to 62. Uh, the same thing happened with China from 4% to 23%. However, you can see that the US and Europe uh, have declined and then their influence has been decreased. So now, uh, for example, in the US, 80% of APIs comes from abroad. Um, One of the biggest problems right now is uh, the supply chain and accessibility issue with uh, pharmaceuticals. So uh, the COVID-19 uh, has highlighted this crisis and it has shown uh, how uh, easily uh, these uh, shortages can happen. So uh, in general, like uh, the public is very dependent on uh, APIs from, uh, uh, from abroad and uh, Logistical challenges uh, are, are something that plagues this industry. So um, this causes significant drug shortages as uh, businesses are facing challenges in obtaining raw materials due to inter international disruptions. As uh, of course, when COVID started, every country wanted to secure the most APIs for themselves. So India did the same thing. In 2020, they uh, lowered their exports to um, other countries um, in order to focus on their own domestic production. Uh, however, I mean, many of these medicines are life-saving and uh, that's what's a big problem because it's not only paracetamol that's being affected by this or other over-the-counter medicines it's also life-saving uh, treatments such as insulin or cancer treatments uh, an example of this from the eu has been um, 
adrenaline pumps for uh, people for people with severe severe allergies at the beginning of the pandemic uh, they were advised by the national governments to keep their uh, adrenaline pens until their expiry date because there was no uh, available stock of uh, adrenaline pens available so the next thing that is important is also the affordability. Uh, it's one of the priorities by WHO uh, that says that equitable access to essential medicines depend on affordable pr uh, pricing and effective financing. Uh, this means that uh, promoting fair prices is what's, what should be the central um, part of uh, every pharmaceutical policy, because uh, what needs to be taken into account is that uh, the public sector is the one that needs to um, do a bigger leap and uh, actually make the medications available for everyone. Because it's not only about uh, people that uh, have a wide access to public health, it's also those, uh, the most vulnerable groups uh, and uh, that are often faced with uh, sexual and racial discrimination. And finally, uh, the third point is international disruption, because I, like I said, reliance on overseas production can easily uh, lead to uh, disruptions in production and uh, any kind of uh, international tension can affect this. An example of this, which is fairly recent, has been the Ukrainian conflict, because uh, due to the conflict, uh, a lot of governments uh, started uh, their uh, national uh, stock of uh, medications because they were afraid uh, what could happen in a case of a nuclear attack. And uh, a, a policy like this that's been implemented by the EU has been rescue. Uh, and uh, a lot of the stock has also been sent to Ukraine, uh, such as iodine pills or um, uh, security suits. Um, so yeah, here we want to elaborate more, maybe a point um, you didn't tackle it deeply about the waste crisis of pharmaceutical uh, companies, as Selma mentioned, um, and also Ms. Londes mentioned in the report, uh, the, despite of the opacity of the data, she mentioned that manufacturing outside Europe now accounts for 60 to 80%, and it's all mostly in Asia, as we saw in India and China. And this is basically because they have lower environmental regulations um, when it comes to waste management. And they are, um, <clears throat> This is a picture from China. Um, they are dumping the waste uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients in, in water and lakes. And this water contamination um, is a public health threat because, for example, in antibiotics, <clears throat> when the, the companies uh, manufacture facilities in China and India dumping the uh, antibiotic waste uh, in the water, um, it's actually, as we found in this report, it's uh, by European Health Alliance, how pharma industry is fueling the rise of superbugs through pollution in its supply chain. So when we throw the, the waste of antibiotics, it's actually dramat drastically increase uh, the superbugs or uh, <clears throat> the drug bacteria resistance, the drug resistance bacteria that makes our body more resistant to antibiotics. So it seems like... Can you... Yeah, it seems like we're producing more and more antibiotics and ignoring its waste because multinationals are ignoring the pollution problem and waste problem that's making our body more resistant to it. This makes us question clearly whether the motive um, is public health in the first place. Can we go back? Sorry. Yeah. So uh, that's why in the report, uh, one of the 10 measures Ms. Londlex uh, mentioned is a dire need to define an ethical and ecological industrial uh, policy for manufacturing facilities outside of the EU. Uh, when we speak about the global south, I mean, mostly what we spoke about now has been uh, how they provide uh, active ingredients to develop uh, to developed uh, world. However, uh, what's important to say is that the global south has achieved many things in recent years in uh, fostering their industry, but also their public policies. Um, there have been positive connections between industry, universities, and the people in the Global South. And uh, this has been uh, due to uh, successful public campaigns and availability of uh, public health, which we saw in the Brazilian model. Uh, however, I mean, there are still some challenges and uh, it's mostly regarding uh, like a, a lack of trust of uh, the public in uh, the public system because a lot of people, for example, in India, 60% of people oppose uh, clinical tri trials being done on Indian population, even though their industry is very well, well developed. And uh, 
Another issue is uh, the disqualification of efforts of Global South to do the big leap that they have in this industry, and it's mostly done by the Western world. Uh, a good example of this, uh, even though China and Russia are not considered to be developing countries, has been uh, the, the uh, deployment of the Chinese and uh, Russian vaccines during the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Western world did not recognize these vaccines. And even though uh, they were, um, a, a lot of them were a part of humanitarian aid for all around the world, uh, they just weren't recognized. And we had examples, uh, Sputnik and uh, Sinopharm, and uh, we, had examples of students who came here, but they were they were not able to get their vac vaccination certificate just because they were vaccinated with one of these two vaccines, even though that was the only choice that they had. Um, another example is that um, of this is that um, the deployment of vaccines around the world uh, has been slower in the developing countries due to in, uh, unavailability of vaccines because uh, the Western companies send them after they vaccinated the most of their own population. Next slide, please. So in terms of this, uh, we can speak about how does relocation of the pharmaceutical industry actually help and uh, what's the role of public health care in this. Um, it helps in a variety of ways uh, because uh, accessibility is directly correlated with uh, low drug prices. If you have a, uh, a drug that's available to everybody at an affordable price, of course, that the population is going to have better access to health. Uh, next thing is that it fosters supply chain resilience because uh, when you have a local production, uh, there's going to be less external disruptions such as international conflicts because the entire supply chain is based in one place. So next is also that it reduces shortages because there are less supply chain challenges and uh, supports knowledge transfer because when you have a local well-developed pharmaceutical industry, you will also have a public and private partnerships, um, a, a partnerships between universities and uh, these uh, big pharmaceutical companies and also health will be a priority, not profit. And maybe last thing, um, just for... Ms. Lunde, I'm, I'm from Egypt, and uh, yeah, I'll gladly uh, mention, um, you mentioned Brazilian model uh, for public uh, provision of, um, of healthcare, and also in this example, Egypt has done unprecedented uh, effort in eradicating hepatitis C and producing uh, Sopus Bovier in a generic version locally. Um, so yeah, it was able to, to scan over 60 million uh, and uh, treat uh, over five, uh, four millions through throughout six years, and um, yeah, this 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 was unprecedented in Africa, and now it's trying to replicate the model and transfer it to uh, other African countries. Um, uh, we are done. We have like a few questions, and then we would like to to also invite the our colleagues to ask questions. Miss um, uh, Londex. Like, as you mentioned, you've been an activist in this field for over um, 17 years. When it comes to pressure or pressuring for relocation to the EU, uh, who is currently the most influential uh, party or stakeholder, um, like uh, the civil society or uh, public policy, like who, who can um, drive the, um, the impact? And also, do you have you noticed a change in in, in awareness after uh, COVID and the the supply chain disruption uh, issues? Should we continue listening all the questions? Okay, um, yeah, because um, as we mentioned, like the all the manufacturing is uh, in Asia and outsourcing. We know it's mostly because of cheaper costs there. So, how much you think if the relocation happened, the prices? of medication will, will change uh, or increase afterwards. And Salma's question about... Yeah, uh, about the uh, TRIPS agreement, because you mentioned it in your presentation. Uh, does it foster or hinder innovation around the world? Um, what I wanted to add to this question is that uh, there is a big problem uh, with uh, international agreements because um, they uh, push this idea of uh, global governance, but not uh, every country uh, can benefit from global governance and not every country can fit to, into this model. I, um, it might be a bit like a monocropping. So what's your opinion on this? 
Thank you. So I will switch on. Thanks. The volume here. So Pauline, I switch my mic and and I, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Selma and Nada, for the great presentation um, and all the things that you that you have said and for your questions. So I will try to to answer. Um, uh, the first one was uh, who has been the most um, who are the actors the more the, the more influential uh, on the relocation. I think there are different actors with different interests and aims. Um, there are some people working on public health, uh, and uh, I think I'm part of, of them as part of civil society. There are also uh, um, economists. Um, there are also there are, there are many people within civil society uh, who, have, who I think are trying to uh, who are speaking more and more in media, who are publishing uh, things on the topic, uh, pushing for this relocation. But there is also, of course, the multinational companies who are fighting with other interests in mind, which is to uh, maybe relocate with, but only with some with their conditions, which is to uh, to get more funding, public funding, to uh, as a condition for relocation. Um, on the poli political aspects, I would say uh, that unfortunately, even though there is more people who are more people elected uh, the parliaments who are who are fighting for it it's still a very uh, small minority uh, of them who are pushing these issues um i would say that the people also very interesting on this who are influential is the some of jo some journalists who are conducted very interested uh, interesting uh, investigations to try to see a little bit more to have more information on the uh despite the opacity so also journalists and also i would say maybe these days uh health health workers uh public hospital doctors who are facing who are seeing who are in the incapacity to provide medicines to the people uh, they care for so um i think them as well have been pushing a lot uh, for this issue to be uh, to be solved and maybe through the relocation um, which leads to the other question, which is the price um, relocation. Yes, but uh, at the price of uh, of we, with uh, higher prices. So it's an argument that we hear a lot from pharmaceutical companies: is to say, if we relocate, the prices will be higher. But once again, if we compare the estimated cost of productions calculated by Androil and the final product uh, price at the price marketed, for example, in France. We see that there is a huge gap uh, between the uh, now it's uh, 34,000 euros for the Sophos Buvir with the hundred of euros of production in India or in China. So um, I think increasing the price of the production uh, is not necessarily a problem if there is rational behind it. If we can, if states can see, can have in hands uh, the rational that conducts to this price. Because the problem is to have always the same thing, the request from the companies to have more funding, more public funding, and to increase the price, but without any criteria. We need, uh, I think we really need uh, criteria. So, so that was uh, to answer to this question. I hope it answered to it. On the TRIPS agreement and on global governance, clearly there should be, um, we need an organization such as the World Health Organization stronger on health products issues and governance uh, because unfortunately some of the states within who within wto are pushing for the interest for their own interest for the interest of their the main multinationals so there is uh, clearly a, a need to uh, maybe to to invent to uh, to create a new kind of uh, global governance for health products uh, yes, so I hope I, uh, I reply to, to your questions. Thank you again. Thanks. Th thanks a lot. The, the micro march. Okay. Do you hear me? Great. Oui, oui. So so we'll take we'll take questions from the from the audience now. We'll collect some questions and then uh, three four questions and then you answer the the three four questions. Yeah. 
Thank you. <clears throat> um, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, okay, so thank you, Nadine Sarma, for the great presentation. I have two questions. The first is that, uh, is that the WTO rules um, forces uh, rules force uh, countries to comply with uh, inter intellectual property laws. So in the 1990s, we have seen the uh, India entered into the WTO and China entered in 2001. So did that affect their local production of drugs? That is my first question. And my second question is that we talk about the relocation of drugs that are, I would say, fairly easy to produce, such as paracetamol or antibiotics. But what about uh, uh, emerging technologies such as gene therapy or other very complicated drugs that perhaps people here in Europe don't even know how to produce? How can the authorities um, help to produce these drugs that uh, that are needed. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned briefly one point during your presentation that uh, France, French hospitals were discussing right now about um, producing some medicines, and I was wondering, like which medicines and yeah if you could extend a bit on that and if it concerns also like paracetamol for example so maybe i answer to these three questions or one more okay as you okay i start um so thank you very much for the questions uh, very interesting questions the first one um it's a very good point that you made about trips agreements because uh, so um, the countries that signed the that became members of WTO, uh, such as India, uh, and uh, all these developed countries had uh, had uh, an extension to uh, to implement the agreements uh, for different years, and that's why India started uh, only to implement trips the trips agreements in two thousand five. Uh, and yes, you are absolutely right. It had an impact on uh, the production of medicines. And clearly, we see that some medicines that India could produce before 2005, which were medicines uh, still uh, under patent in most countries, they were not patented in India. And it's also what helped India to develop its, um, its production of medicines. So clearly, we see this impact. Uh, and also, if we read the TRIPS agreements, this uh, extension of uh, this, uh, this, this time uh, that some countries have to uh, implement the, the agreements, the least developed countries, how the TRIPS agreements describe it, it's exactly for that to leave the room for countries to develop their production uh, sectors, their, uh, their, their production capacities. And a country such as Bangladesh has, uh, has done it very well as well. We are developing a lot of API production and, uh, and production. So yes, it has uh, directly an impact. And what countries such as India try to do, and Brazil as well, was to, um, to develop patent law to implement TRIPS, because after, trip, after they enter into TRIPS, they had to implement TRIPS, and then they had to change their law. They try to include uh, as much as many safeguards, public health safeguards in their law, and India did it uh, pretty well. So yes, uh, clearly there is a, there is a link in, in this. Uh, now in the capacity, um, the gene therapies, the examples you 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 gave, I think um, I think um, most of the medicines that we mentioned, the essential medicines, they are, they are easy to produce. They have been produced sometimes for more than one century. So there is not uh, such a complexity to produce them. New medicines, it depends which ones. Um, they are not necessarily so complicated to produce. So um, I don't think that uh, it, that it would be the main obstacle uh, to, uh, to relocate. I, I would not think so. And finally, uh, to reply to the last questions on public uh, hospitals, um, I 
maybe it's a bit uh, complex and long to develop here, but um, we publish, I published uh, an op-ed in Le Monde last month about it. So if you are interested, you can look at it uh, more in details. But for example, in uh, within Lyon hospitals, uh, there are some, uh, some, some experiments to produce some uh, therapies uh, that can, that are called in French, phage therapies and that are targeting some bacteria that have been that are that became resistant to antibi antibiotics so um, that's ex an example of the kind of public production that can be made uh, that's uh, what an example among others unfortunately now there is not a strong uh, will in france there is not a strong political will to have more uh, to have more public production in hospitals, but it's something that we, uh, civil society, uh, activists are pushing for uh, strongly. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you that uh, when you were talking about the concentration of the pharmaceutical market and pointing out that there are less actors now, uh, you meant regarding sellers and producers of particular medicines or in the industry overall? Because recently I read a paper of John Busfield where she said that although the process of mergers and acquisitions might suggest that there is more concentration and consolidation in the industry, in the, the total number of pharmaceutical companies uh, with ongoing drug developments, in the last 20 years has increased and as a result and she, she also mentions that the share of the top 10 companies for example actually fell during this period from 46 to 40 percent for example uh, but she also says that there is evidence of consolidation in some particular in a uh, treatments so my my question was in that direction thanks Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the imports of APIs, if of API, if that like overtaking those imports could be a strategy at least in the short term to have a better position to negotiate over uh, big pharma industry, and if so, if that it's feasible. And then on another uh, note, what's the role of university in relocating? uh production because one would guess it could play play actually a big role hi um good afternoon thank you very much for the presentation and for the work uh, you've been doing thank you also for the colleagues that presented um, I have two questions. We've also been having a class on pharmaceutical patents and public health with Natalie Coutine. Um, and we've been having some discussions. And one thing that we've discussed lately was how in the past 20 years, uh, there's been um, an increase in financialization and um, power of the big pharma and how this is related also to state capture, because of course, all these medicines are regulated by the state. Um, and we discussed a lot about the U.S., but I was wondering, because you're talking a lot about pharmaceutical industrial policy, how do you see this going forward in Europe? Uh, can industrial policy of Europe not go in the direction of that the big pharma wants, that the big companies want, uh, given the, the current power? And do you think that this power is going to increase or decrease and how uh, that can play a role in industrial policy? And then uh, second question more um, concerning Global South countries uh, and the compulsory licensing, because from, from what I understand, the compulsory license, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, restrictions to it. And I think the COVID, uh, it gave a good opportunity of breaking some of these restrictions. And, and I think uh, in Brazil, for example, the, the, compu the, the break of the, of the patents for with the compulsory license came with COVID, um, and but I I'm still a bit skeptical of how much uh, this is possible going forward. 
Uh, so how do you see the, the COVID crisis as an opportunity for compulsory licensing also in moments that are not moments of crisis uh, and how the international agreements like the TRIPS can actually uh, force or not uh, countries to, to necessarily um, take those patents? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I will reply uh, to this to this uh, to these questions. Um, um, first of all, for, to, to reply to the first question, I would be very interested to see uh, this paper on the concentration of the market by uh, John Booth that you mentioned. Uh, I've, I've not uh, I've not seen it, so I would be very interested to to see it. Um, to reply to, to the second questions. Um, I didn't really understand the import. Uh, the the question was the, on the importation. How states could import better, right? Or what could uh, they could have a different strategy of to import? No, no. Uh, I mean, yes, on imports of key uh, supplies, but also if managing those imports in a more active way could be uh, could be more could give more leverage to states to negotiate. Uh, in uh, to negotiate prices with big pharma industries. Um, so it would be, for example, to import. Uh, uh, would it be to understand to, to be sure that I understand well um, to import from countries, uh, for example, that would produce at um, at a lower price to um, to have the importation as some uh, leverage. Uh, as some uh, kind of leverage to negotiate the prices better, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. No. Absolutely. It's a great question. It goes uh, very well with the question of the relocation. The, the only problem I see in this is that where do you import from? Um, it's complicated because mo in most countries, apart from China, India, maybe Bangladesh, because it's still the least developed countries, it's patented. It will be patented in, in most countries. So if you um, well, except if it's a non-patented drug, but let's imagine that if for the negotiation of the price of a new drug, then it would be patented. Um, so then the, the difficulty is that you will need to make a compulsory license and maybe that the country where you want to import from will have to make a compulsory license for export. So you will have to make two compulsory licenses, uh, two compulsory licenses for, for, for this. So it's a... Uh, Let's say that it brings a little bit more complexity, but technically it can be possible. And actually, it happened in the past. Uh, we had the examples for uh, uh, HIV drugs, so I think it's um, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a very good uh, it's also a very good thing. Uh, so on the universities, the question of universities is very interesting as well because universities are always playing a very important role in the in the uh, in the research and development process. So yes, we can. We could totally imagine uh, production that would uh, also be linked to the universities that uh, make that uh, that are parts of the process of uh, on R and D. So yes, completely, completely agree. Uh, now on the power within Europe, the power of big pharma. Um, what was interesting with the with the resolution and transparency that we fought for in 2019 is that we saw clearly um, we saw clearly uh, two groups two groups of countries within the European Union we saw the countries from South Europe and the countries from northwestern Europe who were against the resolutions the countries from South Europe were Greece Spain Portugal Italy um, and they were uh, supportive of the resolution. It's actually the Italian government who proposed uh, who proposed the resolution, because these countries they are facing they are have been implementing many austerity measures uh, in the in the past years. Maybe not Portugal, but uh, other countries they have been doing that. So they, are, they they see the impacts of high high prices of medicines on their health systems. And therefore, they, they want to find uh, solutions. Um, and so it was very interesting what happened. The problem is that this has changed. The government, for example, in Italy is completely different now. Um, in, uh, in Spain, maybe there are more opportunities now. 
What I mean is that the political changes in each member state has, has also an impact on um, on the power um, the, the the power relationships in Brussels um, and the interactions within member states in Brussels and the, the impact the the counter power. Let's say that there is probably. Uh, in my opinion now, I, I see less counter power to companies now in Brussels than maybe three years ago before the COVID crisis and uh, before the, at the moment of the resolution on transparency. So uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's what, I, what I can see or feel, but maybe I am, uh, I am wrong on this. And now to, uh, to reply to the last question, which was on, on compulsory license. Compulsory license for COVID vaccines, they were not used so much for one reason that I think it's important to see. And that, that's why uh, uh, our organization, for example, uh, uh, fought for the waiver, is because to uh, issue a compulsory license, you need to first identify the patents. It can seem a very simple uh, thing, but it's not the case. Uh, we have also a lot of opacity in the field of patents, which is uh, contradictory with the principle of patents, which is uh, the grant of a monopoly in exchange uh, from the states, in exchange for the release of the of the invention to the to the to the society. In reality, um, there is a lot a lot of opacity in this field. And for example, I did a lot of uh, cartography, uh, patent, uh, patent landscape. I did uh, many of them. And for example, for one medicine, you can have some time in one country, 300, 400 patents. So um, for developing countries, it's very challenging. Sometimes it's very difficult for them to see if there is a blocking patents, if they have a freedom to operate, or if they are not, or if they, they, can, um, they can maybe have um, they can be sued by pharmaceutical company if they decide to produce a drug that's still under patents. So it's a real problem to know if you can issue compulsory license, you need to know first on which, uh, which patents you need, to, uh, to, you need to, to identify them. And for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, it was very difficult because here there had been so many patents also on the technology itself, the ARN, uh, uh, messager de uh, NRN. So there has been there has been also a lot on this. That's why uh, we fought once again for this waiver at WTO because we thought it was more easy as well for countries to uh, not to have to uh, to do many compulsory licensing compulsory licensing on many different patents, uh, but uh, to have to simply say that there will not be patent infringements. Um, if a country decides to produce itself the, the vaccine. I don't know if I, uh, if yes, I have a question. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and to my colleagues. So uh, my question is related to, um, you were mentioning and also Selma Nara that uh, these big pharma companies, their profits are not coming that much of like the selling of drugs, but actually from buybacks or, or from the financial now. So like we could, address them as financialized, non-financial corporations, as we've been discussing in other courses. And so how relevant is then uh, that the um, main focus on the regulation comes from WHO or health authorities in Europe? And shouldn't the focus be more on the financial aspect? So shouldn't be more treated as financialized companies and therefore um, more regulated in that way? in order to prevent from becoming even bigger? And because, um, yeah, that, that's the question. Thank you. Oh, yes, uh, that was the last question. Thank you. OK, 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 then I reply. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I think what, that's one thing it's, that's very challenging with pharmaceutical issues is that it links many uh, fields that are, that are very different from, pharma, from pharma, pharmacology to uh, intellectual property to uh, economics, self-economics, and so on. And uh, what you said and what you asked is very important also for that because uh, I agree that there is not only 
that WHO by itself alone uh, can't do anything on uh, health products, unfortunately, because there are many other things to take into, uh, into account, which are linked to economics. Um, and the things that you suggest seem to me uh, very important as well to uh, prevent this uh, concentration or to, to address this uh, concentration and financialization of the, of the sector. Thank you. Thank you for all the good questions. I hope I, I, uh, I reply the best way. Thank you very much, Pauline. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, very much. Uh, I hope Thank to you. see you soon. Uh. And we, we hope to see you in person you. next year. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.